Washington, this is my story. This is my story, it's not my own story. It is a story told by the storytellers themselves. They tell the story of their humble beginnings and how they rose up to the positions of fame and recognitions where they find themselves today. I am in London here to uh, interview Pastor Claude Palm Ejapong, who is the pastor in charge of the International Praise Center in London. He happens to be my grandnephew. Uh, I'm honored to be your grand uncle, Pastor Claude. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to interview Pastor Claude because he amazes me. I, I knew him from his childhood days, and after a long spell, I suddenly heard that he's leading a very powerful church in London called International Praise Center. And not only that, he had some other churches as well. So I'm going to ask Pastor Claude Ejapong to give us first a brief history of how did you come about with this building here. Thank you very much. This building, as you see, it, is an old public house. It's a pub, what we call in uh, normal British parlance, a pub. It's a place where people meet to drink and also used to have some dwellings or what we'll probably call an inn for people who would stay overnight. Um, we took over this building in the year 2014 and that is after um, the country had hosted the Olympics and there had been a transition in the sporting world where one of the famous football clubs in London, the West Ham Football Club, mm -hmm. who used to play just across the road from here in Upton Park, moved to the um, London, the new, their new stadium at the Olympic Park, the Queen Elizabeth um, Park. And so the pub was no longer being used. It was derelict. And we came and took over with the aim of transforming it into a community facility, which includes um, different uses. Okay, like what, like such as? So we are a church, as you know, a Baptist church. Yes. And so in this building, we have a place of worship, okay. uh, which we use on Sundays. Mm -hmm. We also use that same building for community purposes. So we do have um, young people coming in and out to um, learn different um, skills. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, there's a provision for music, media, sports and mentoring. Mm -hmm. In the same building, we also do have a nursery or childcare provision. We cater for young children from three months up to five years. And we have a nursery facility, which um, I'll show you around, um, providing for children of that age group. And they access free childcare here. And it allows them to, um, first of all, have a best start to life and again it frees parents to also um, work and to do other things and it's an opportunity for us to engage with our community as well because you know that parents naturally have an affinity to their, where their children are mm -hmm. so we have a lot of parents walking through our doors and getting to know about our church and how we also serve the community in other ways from the primary school age to the secondary school age, we have um, the holiday club provision for them. Mm -hmm. So we run what we call the HALF program, right. um, the holiday activity and food program. Yeah. So we've got young children from age six all the way to age 16 mm -hmm. coming in during the holidays and they eat breakfast here. We serve breakfast. Um, f um, healthy breakfast yeah. and lunch and other refreshments mm -hmm. and they spend the time here to play games they also have um, mentoring sessions so we've got mentors who talk to them helping them to know where they are at in life and where they want to get to okay. inspiring them to have ambitions in life and taking them out of crime and then we also help them to know how they can support their own families out of poverty. Mm -hmm. So we teach them where they can access um, 
cheap food, but healthy food, yeah. and then promote healthy eating amongst young people, because you know that um, a healthy mind is found in a healthy body. Yeah. So we take them through that as well. And then um, we have the younger um, adults or young adults, um, the university age, where we also have a lot of um, community outreaches. So we do um, food distribution, we serve homeless people, and they are um, the ones who are actually involved in that. So we go out with food and we give food to the homeless people in the community. We also, as I said, have people who live in the building and um, they volunteer in different aspects of the ministry. Okay, could you describe a little bit of the makeup of this building, the segments? What are the various fields? So this building, as I indicated earlier on, is an old public house or a pub. And so it's quite a humongous building, big in size, and it is over four floors. Starting from the very bottom, we've got a basement, which serves as storage for all our gear and equipment for ministry. We've also got the ground floor, and that is where we are. The ground floor serves as our auditorium or our worship center. So this is where church actually happens. This is where we meet on Sundays and on weekdays to have worship. And um, as you can see, we've got all the equipment here. We've got our musical equipment, which is for our lively church services on Sundays. This hall is also used by um, other community interest groups. So this is a very multicultural area. We've got people from different nations and different faith backgrounds. And so often they can come in to hold meetings. We've hosted the MP here, Steve Timms. We've had quite a number of counselors coming in to um, have their counseling surgery and to have other meetings here. We've also got the local authority, which is the Newham Council, coming here for different activities and different events. Um, that includes an organization called My Time. So uh, in, in brief, the hall is used for multiple purposes, aside our Sunday worship. And then you go to the first floor, and that is for our education and training as well as childcare. So we've got a nursery facility for young children from the ages of three months to five years. We've also got rooms for training. And then we have um, the um, second floor, which is a residential accommodation for, um, I'll say a short term residential accommodation. We call it our dwellings. And so we've got people who may be in between houses. You may be moving on from one house to another and you need a stop gap place. We can accommodate you there. There are people who travel, you know, London is very much of a nomadic city where people move from one country and they stop over here. And so when we get uh, migrants coming in and they need a place to stay, we provide them with accommodation. Some of our church members are students, and you know, accom student accommodation is extremely expensive in London. And so we provide some of our students or some of our members who are studying in the universities here with accommodation. So on, um, um, within the building, we provide for different people for different needs, as you may have seen. Let's give a spiritual connotation to my question now. You didn't have to exercise this building to be able to bring this building as a church from its history of being a pub. Did you have to exercise this building? We did not have to exercise this building in the way you may be thinking, but as Christians, we believe that before you occupy any building, you have to pray. And so a lot of prayer went into the building before we finally came in. And even after we came in, we, we pray. We, we've, we've been here close to, um, for um, close to 10 years now, um, but we pray all the time. 
And um, we believe that because it used to be a former pub, which was used notoriously for drinking and for all sorts of antisocial activities, it now being transformed into God's house demands that we give um, reverence and spiritual attention to the use of a place. So we pray and um, we've done a lot of praying in and around the building. Well, this is the time to ask you to introduce yourself, really. You, from this humble beginnings, you, your, I'm sure your mother was the most perfect person who held your hands into adulthood. First of all, let's know who you are. What do you, what do you pastorize? Well, to introduce myself, um, you know me very well, Uncle Frank, because I am related to you as you introduced at the beginning. But my name is Claude Halmejapon. I am born to Ghanaian parents. Uh, my father used to be um, the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast in Ghana, Professor SKA Japon and um, a Methodist minister and the former principal of a Methodist University College in Ghana. My mother is Joyce in Japan. She's a school teacher and a businesswoman and a God-fearing prayer warrior. And I would always want to bring in my mother as a prayer warrior every time I'm introducing myself because I believe her prayers have, to a very large extent, contributed to who I am. And so my parents raised me as a, as a Christian. Um, I grew up partly in Ghana and in other countries as well. Um, I lived my adult life uh, um, here in the United Kingdom because right after my education, I relocated to the United Kingdom to study and um, I um, continued to pursue a career in um, education or in teaching in the United Kingdom. So I trained as a school teacher and then I moved on into further education where I became um, a college lecturer and then I progressed to um, establish my own educational consultancy, Academia Consult Limited, and became an educational consultant working for the government of the United Kingdom, including the Child Care Workforce Development Council, Tribal Education, um, Newham College of Further Education, and other reputable establishments and local authorities. So I worked as an educational consultant, um, primarily um, consulting on early years education and aspects of diasporan educational psychology. So that's my, my background. And then I moved on into ministry, which I believe is very significant because most people know me as Pastor Claude. And so I had the opportunity of studying theology in one of the reputable theological institutions here in the United Kingdom. And it's quite interesting because I feel that I've been very blessed to have studied in very reputable um, institutions. I studied um, um, education at the University of London. I did my doctorate in theology at the University of London. And my pastoral training was also at um, Spurgeon's College, which is um, which was then accredited by the University of Wales. So I studied theology, but I did not go into pastoral ministry immediately. I did bivocational ministry. So I did my work in education, and then I also served as a pastor in the Baptist church. Um, I am married to Gertrude. Um, many people call her Trudy or Lady G, but um, her name is Gertrude Halme Japon. We've been married for um, 20 years now, and we are blessed with two children, Samuel and Joy. So we've got um, a girl um, who's the younger one and a boy who is the older one. We make our home here in London. We live in East London, um, and um, we are very blessed to be associated with the work of ministry in the East London area. My wife is a great support and a great inspiration. She's an entrepreneur herself. She's also actively involved in the work of ministry, although she's not a pastor. And I want 
um, she, she, I want her to know because she doesn't want to be a pastor, so she always says that um, I should make it clear. People sometimes call her lady pastor and all of that. But my wife is um, an ordinary um, minister and a member of a church, but actively involved in the work of ministry. We are blessed with lots of friends and family here in London, and we are really encouraged by many people. Okay. As you left your mother's arms, let's start with what did she instill in you to bring, to, to bring you to this stage? As I said earlier on, I have drawn a lot of inspiration from my mother, Joyce, and not just my mother, because if I talk about uh, my mother, I always want to connect her to my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, that's my mother's mother, um, Josephine, was very inspirational in my early childhood and my um, early years as well, because I lived with her for a while. And she was a great, great, great woman of God, a Christian woman who was very much into church, into prayer, and into her morning devotion. So I myself, together with my um, other cousins who um, grew up in her house, learned our Bible study life from our grandmother. And so my grandmother was very inspirational in raising me as a very young child. And interestingly enough, all the young men that she raised, there were three of us, myself, my two other cousins, we all ended up becoming pastors. My older cousin, um, Pastor Johnny, is one of the um, senior ministers in the Church of Pentecost in the United States of America. Um, my other cousin, um, Bishop Alex, is a bishop of international, um, um, of, of her, his own ministry in um, the United States of America. And I am here in the United Kingdom actively working in ministry. Back to my mother. My mother is a prayer warrior. She loves to pray. And she gathers people in her house to pray. And, and, and my mother, um, invested a lot of um, prayer in, in, in my life. And I know that she always, always, always prays for me. So mom, wherever you are, if you are watching, I want to say thank you for your prayers. And apart from the prayers, another thing is discipline. You know, my mother is a teacher. And so you can imagine um, in the house of a teacher, there is a lot of discipline. So we were very disciplined in terms of the time that you go to bed, the time that you wake up, how you dress, how you address an elder, um, and, and all those things, taking your academic work very seriously. So we had a lot of home discipline, and uh, it's very important. My mother used to say that three things are important when you are raising up a child. The first is church training, so she made sure that we were actively involved in church. The second one is school training, so she made sure that we were um, very much into our academic work. And then the final one is home training. And so these three ingredients are very much um, an important, um, or they're very much of important ingredients that contributed to my upbringing. And, and I would also mention that my father is, 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 is he's a great, 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 my, my father is my hero. He's the one that I look up to. My father is not just my biological father, he's my spiritual father as well, because he's also a very spiritual man. He's a minister of a gospel and very wise and very intelligent, very humble. And I have gleaned a lot of qualities from my father as well. So I'll mention my father, my mother, and my grandmother. Okay. And how did that lead you to priesthood? So my getting into priesthood, as you will call it, but you know, I am a Baptist, so we use the term pastor. And the term pastor probably resonates with a lot of people who are listening to us. So my um, training into ministry started way back in the secondary school. I'll go as far back as in 1989, when I was in the secondary school in Adisado College in Cape Coast, Ghana. So I'm a Santa Clausian. I, I, I went to Adisado College. And um, in those years, Scripture Union was a thing. And there was another ministry called the Calvary Road Incorporated. So these were the two ministries that literally inspired me into um, pursuing the course of ministry, because I was the Calvary Road overseer for all the secondary schools in the Cape Coast area, in central region. So you mentioned schools like Infancipim, St. Augustine's College, um, Ghana National College, 
Agri Memorial, all the way through to Infam Infant Seman, Holy Child, and, and we had fellowships in those schools and I was the overseer. And interestingly, that is where I got the name Bishop because it was Bishop was my nickname. It was like um, just a pal name. So everybody called me Bishop Claude and it, uh, it has stayed till date. A lot of people refer to me as Bishop. So just to let you know, that's how I got the nickname Bishop Claude. And um, I was also a leader in the scripture union. And I thought I was just doing these things because that's, that's what um, it meant if duty calls. But then when I got into the university, the sense of God's call upon my life became even stronger because I led um, in the student's ministry in the University of Cape Coast as well. And I had the opportunity to do my very first church plant when I was in the university. I wasn't an ordained pastor, but I was an overseer of a church. So we um, inaugurated the Harvest Community Church on the university campus, which is still um, there till date. And I had um, close friends who were working with me in ministry, Reverend Simon Ampofu, uh, Reverend Joseph Asma or Joe Asma um, in the United States of America. So we worked on a church plant together. So when I came out of university, my intention was not to pursue full-time ministry. My intention was to have a career. And so I took a career path, which was a career in academia. And so I trained to be a teacher here in the United Kingdom, trained to teach in federal education, as I said. And then in the year 2012, that was when I felt called into full-time ministry. So I gave up everything that I was doing and then moved into full-time ministry. So I dropped all my teaching and my um, educational consultancy. I dropped everything and I plunged myself into full-time ministry. All right, and I have been told that if I should use this term, you are a practical theologist. What's all that about? Um, yes, as I said, I was trained in very reputable institutions um, as a theologian. So I studied theology. So I've studied theology from the degree level to a doctoral level. Um, and um, I, my field of theology is practical or pastoral theology. And it's quite interesting because a lot of people would like to know what practical theology or pastoral theology is all about. Well, it is that branch of theology that helps people to reflect on their relationship with God and where God is at work in the life of man or where God is at work in this world. And so the practical theologian will ask practical questions such as where is God in this and what is God saying? So practical theology comes with theological reflection. So what happens is that in your life as a Christian, sometimes you get caught up in a lot of things and I, I want to break it down for those of us who are not theologians to understand. You get caught up in a lot of duties. So for example, you may be giving out food and clothing to homeless people. And you are just doing it for doing sake because your pastor or the church is doing it. And a lot of churches do a lot of things to tick the boxes that, oh, we are feeding the homeless. We are doing that, we are doing that. But what I do as a practical theologian is to help people to reflect on why they are doing what they are doing and what God is saying about what they are doing. And I read, um, some very important theologians, and I would like to share some of them with you. Uh, my favorite theologian is a man called David Tracy. Um, David, David Tracy, um, I read his Analogical Imagination, The Blessed Rage of Order, and, and, and he is a pastoral, a practical theologian. So um, I read um, David Tracy, and, and another practical theologian that I read is a, um, a theologian called Jerry Teha. And Jerry Teha talks about diasporan theology, and that is where God is at work when people move from one 
nation to another. So I am originally from Ghana. I've come to settle here in the United Kingdom. I've made the United Kingdom my home. I call it home and I am actively working as a change agent of God in my community. And so I have read um, the diasporan theology of Jerry Taha, but my favorite theologian actually from the black African world is a man that I had an opportunity to study under as well, and that is Professor Kwame Bediako, the late Professor Kwame Bediako of blessed memory. He established the Acrophic Christola um, Theological Center in Ekropong in Ghana, and I remember when I first um, was being interviewed to study theology here in the United Kingdom. He was part of the panel. So I, I had the opportunity of studying under um, Professor Kwame Bidiako of Blessed Memory, and also another very influential theologian who worked closely with Kwame Bidiako, and that is Professor Andrew Walls. Andrew Walls is the one who made that famous statement that God is a prisoner and liberator of our culture. And Andrew Walls is also one theologian that um, I, 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 I really admire and I have studied. So I have got the, uh, the theoretical background to the study of theology and um, I have brought it into practice. So talking about my doctoral work, I did not study for a PhD but I did what we call uh, a DTH, which is a professional doctorate in theology. And that gave me an opportunity to reflect on the work that I am doing in the church with people. So I, I, I did an action research project with my own church and my own community. So I reflected on my journey with my church till date. And then I did um, a, a doctoral resume on that. And so that is what um, practical theology is about. And does this have to do with anything like hands-on healing? All the things we see on stage in churches where in this case you said it has no relation to with the Bible? Has it got any relation at all with the Bible, with its practical theology? Well, practical theology is um, very practical, as I said. And so it's not just limited to the books. I know I've mentioned a lot of books and a lot of theologians, but it's, it's, it's theology in practice. If you come to my church here on Sunday, you know, we worship as in we sing, we clap our hands, we dance, we pray out loud, and we lay hands on people. The Bible says in the book of James that if anyone is sick, they should bring them to the church and call the elders and the elders will lay hands on them. And so we do all of that. Um, I'm very practical and I've also written some practical books. I call them pastoral books, easy read. And that is just a way of bringing theology, breaking it down to manageable pieces for people to really understand. And so I've written a book um, called The Message of the Bible. It's one of my favorite books. It's just about um, how we can understand and know that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. And so when I am healing hands on, as you are saying, I heal based on the Word of God, based on what the Bible says. And so things like this will help people to understand. Um, and I've got quite a few other books, The New Me, which is about how you can become a new creation in Christ. I've got one on the encourager. And you know, as a practical Christian, Everybody gets discouraged at a point in time and you want to be encouraged. And this book, The Encourager, spells it out. The mini it breaks down the ministry of Barnabas, Barnabas who journeyed with Paul. And then you will get to understand that um, being encouraged is important. So it's not just about hands-on healing, but everything is literally brought down to very manageable units for anybody in the church to understand. So whether you like it or not, as a Christian, you are a theologian. Let's go to the mode of worship in your church. What, what, what style do you use? Um, in, what's your style? Yes, as I said, we are a Baptist church. Um, Baptists are evangelicals, but our church is a Baptist church with a Pentecostal 
fervor, which means that we are very, very vibrant in our worship. And so if you look around the building, you see that we've got all the musical instruments here, which we use as part of our worship expression on Sunday. Um, we sing a lot of lively songs. We sing songs from a New Wine Hill song. We sing um, some of the contemporary African songs from people like um, Nathaniel Bassi, Frankie Edwards, and, and, and um, we also sing songs from the United States, some of um, the popular um, American singers, the old ones such as, or the older ones, pardon my language, such as um, Don uh, Moen and bringing it to the very modern or very contemporary ones. And, and in, in our church, the emphasis is on the preaching of the word the preaching of the word. We are a purpose-driven church. And one of the modern um, church leaders that I personally follow is Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church. And um, we are a purpose-driven church because we believe that anybody who comes into the house of God must be able to discover the, who they are in Christ, which is identity, and two, the purpose that God has for them or the reason why they have been created. You will ask yourself a question, why am I alive for such a time as this? There is a reason, there is a purpose. And through the word of God, we teach people to appreciate their purpose. First of all, to identify themselves with Christ and to identify with their purpose for which Christ has created them. To appreciate their purpose and to live out their purpose. And so we are very, very big on the preaching of God's word in our church, aside all the other things. Now, I'm going to ask you this controversial question. I have seen priests in the, in the middle of their preachings when they come to the, to the level of individual prayer, there is this murmuring going on. We're, not, we're never sure whether this is what's called the speaking in tongues. I've seen you also in some of your videos, you actually murmur some of these, uh, make some utterances. Some of us who don't understand this, how can we ever understand what's going on? What is it being said in those unintelligible, if I would use the word, utterances? Well, um, I know speaking in tongues is considered to be controversial, but I don't think it is controversial because it is biblical, but how you use it or how you express it and your understanding of it is what may lead to the controversy. Um, in our church, we pray, and we pray all forms of prayer. So we pray both publicly and privately. We pray in tongues, those who have the gift of praying in tongues, pray in tongues, but we also pray in our understanding. But in our public worship, which is on Sundays, we encourage people to pray in their understanding because Paul said that if you pray in tongues and a stranger comes into your midst, will they not think that you are out of your minds? And so for the sake of um, the newer believers, we encourage people to pray in tongues, but pray in tongues in private and pray in your understanding in public worship. That is not to say that you will never find anybody praying in tongues in our public worship. Yes, sometimes people come under inspiration and they pray in tongues and we don't frown on that. I pray in tongues and I pray a lot in tongues. So just to let you understand that, yes, I am a firm believer in praying in tongues. I believe that it edifies me, it builds up my prayer life, it, it, it lifts my spirit, and it helps me to be able to pray for very long hours. And um, Frank, I took my inspiration when it comes to praying in tongues from no one other than the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who says that every day he prays in tongues for at least an hour. And so I know that it is beneficial to pray in tongues. How does that enhance faith among your congregation? Well, prayer is very important to our congregation. We spend a lot of time in prayer because prayer is our way of um, buying into God's mind. Prayer is not just a monologue, 
but it is a dialogue because as we speak to God in prayer, he also speaks to us and gives us direction in every way. And so um, one of my favorite old time hymns is what a friend we have in Jesus. And you know um, the um, part of a song that says that all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I believe that most of our challenges and our perplexities in life come as a result of us not praying or taking things to God in prayer. A prayerful Christian is a powerful Christian. And one of my good friends, Pastor Ian Christensen, will say that a powerful, a prayerful Christian is a powerful Christian. And therefore, more prayer, more power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. And I think it's, it's, it's a very insightful saying that the more you pray, the more power you draw from the throne room of God. The little you pray, the little power you draw from your powerhouse. And no prayer, you don't have any power at all. So we are a praying church in as much as we are built firmly on the word of God. So the power of prayer, a lot of people go into serious prayer, prayerful moments, and yet, bad things happen to them. How do you Absolutely. convey this to your congregation? Well, the way I see prayer is that um, prayer is a way of bringing God down into your situation. It does not guarantee you good things of, for a lifetime. So the fact that I'm a praying person does not mean bad things will never happen to me. And I would always want to say that good things can happen to good people, but bad things can happen to um, good people as well. So there are instances where bad things can happen to a praying Christian. I know people who have prayed and who have died, but you know what? The most important thing about the life of a Christian is to find yourself in the will of God. And so Christ teaching us to pray taught us to ask God for his will. So he taught us the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. And then it goes, your will be done. And so prayer is a way of bringing us into the will of God so that, hey, when you fall in God's will, that's why Christ, even when he knew he was going to die, said that, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It was a prayer. But he prayed, and at the end of it, what happened? He died. If prayer delivers us from bad things, and it's only good things that will happen, then Christ wouldn't have died. But prayer, rather, is a way of situating us in God's will. So sometimes you may be praying, you know, and um, people pray for all sorts of things. I'm praying that I'm going to get a visa to travel outside my country to go to a, a country that flows with milk and honey. You pray and pray and pray, and I'm saying this because of a good friend of mine who prayed and prayed and prayed and didn't get a visa, and some of his um, um, the colleagues got a visa and they left. And today you go back to where he was left, and he has been blessed abundantly. And he says that the best thing that ever happened to him in life is for the American embassy to have denied him a visa. This is after he had prayed. So prayer can still bring results that you don't expect. But you can pray to destroy your enemies. <laughs> no, what, what, but it, can it be done? Because after all, prayer. Uh, a lot of people pray all sorts of prayer, but I don't pray to destroy my enemy. You know why? Because my Bible tells me that it will be better for my enemy to live long, to see the glory of God revealed in my life. And so I don't pray to destroy my enemies. But I know that, yes, um, a lot of Christians have ways of um, seeking vengeance on their enemies or people that would like to destroy them. But I don't pray to destroy my enemies. But they must be getting some inspiration from the book of Psalms themselves, okay. where there are curse words in Psalms. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. How, this is a contradiction to me. Okay. I will, can, you, can you dwell on this? Yes, obviously in the book of Psalms you would come across um, scriptures where David in particular prayed against 
his enemies. An example is in Psalm 109. And so you know that, yeah, that, that, that there are Psalms that um, talk about God avenging you and God seeking justice and retribution for you against those who hate you. And a lot of people draw inspiration from that. So I believe that, yes, it is true. There are a lot of other parts of scripture, a lot of um, Old Testament scriptures that we see literally God commanding uh, his people to destroy their enemies. And so people draw inspiration from that. But if you come into the New Testament, into the New Dispensation, I draw inspiration from Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, where um, the servant of the high priest called Melchus, you know, um, had his ear cut off by um, Peter because they were literally coming to arrest Jesus. You know, this is somebody that they were coming to capture, to go and kill. And, and Peter drew the sword and cut off. It was, it was a defensive action. But what did Christ do? He took the ear back, put the ear back in place so that instantly that boy got his healing. And then he said to Peter that don't do this because those who live by the sword, they die by the sword. I think it is a practical expression of the love of God amongst our enemies. Why? Because even after the people saw that instant healing of an ear going back in place, if I were one of them, I would have moved back and said, that, no, 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 there must be something special about this man. He's the son of God. But they still arrested him, bundled him up, and killed him. And the Bible says that all those times, Christ did not open his mouth to say a word. And so I believe that it is a test of our character. What we say, where we say those things, how we say those things are all important. And so for me, when I'm praying, I spend most of my time to edify myself, to pray for my enemies, and to see God working in the lives of people. But why are the children of God leaning more towards such corrupt pastors. In terms of size of congregation, there's 10 times more in, that, in those kind of churches than in the regular churches. What is driving congregation to go to them rather than to the regular? Well, this topic of corrupt pastors is something that uh, I may not entirely agree with you because I haven't met any corrupt pastor because I don't have the barometer to judge between the good and the bad. Which I, I, I will keep on asking this. Um, Jesus Christ gave a parable and it was about the seeds that were sown and at night the enemy came and sowed bad seeds and the master or the farmer said that hey I sowed good seeds or the servant said we sowed good seeds and who, who has done this and he said that you allow all of them to grow at the time of harvest, the weeds or the tares will be separated from that which is right. I may think that I am righteous because I am doing what is right. I may think that I've got the message and I'm doing exactly what is right. But you know what? I may not know. And I don't even know what tomorrow is going to be for me from today. And so my prayer is that God will keep me, preserve me, and help me to walk on the path of righteousness as Psalm 23 says that he leads me on the path of righteousness and so that is what I desire in terms of corruption in the church it's not just in the church but I think human beings are naturally corrupt and that is why we need the Holy Spirit who is our helper to lead us to live in a right way and so if you're talking about corruption I think it's just a, a function of human behavior and also, there are other things that I think are ethical. I had the privilege to study ethical issues to a master's level at Spurgeon's College. My lecturer in ethical issues was um, um, Dr. John Colwell. And Dr. Colwell taught me ethical issues. And you will learn that there are certain things that are very ethical. You know, for example, misuse of church offering, church money. I think that. You can look for scriptures and say that, hey, God wants the pastor to be rich and God wants the pastor to exhibit wealth. 
But it's only ethical that if I have money entrusted in my care as a steward, then I should be a good steward of God's money. So I, instead of thinking about buying a new suit or a new car, I am thinking about those who have given their pennies, those who give the money, and they probably need that help. Or even if they don't need the help, their intention to give was for us to be able to propagate a good cause. So I would rather invest the money into the poor, into doing social action, into, into changing and transforming lives so that those lives that are transformed will know that, wow, these people are indeed an epitome of the love of God. And so they will come to appreciate the love of God and the church. What if a pastor in that category, the corrupt category, comes to tell you that, look, Pastor Claude, I am successful with my congregation because I use the power of the Holy Spirit and I use the name of Jesus to heal and that's why my church is thriving. What would be your, your defense? Okay, I can understand what you're saying. Um, there are quite a number of healing ministries and healing ministries usually bring a lot of wealth to the pastors who have that gift. And so we know that in, in, in the church, um, the end time church, gifted ministers, those who can prophesy, those who can heal, um, tend to do better because they get a lot of gifts and some even put a charge on their ministry. Um, I know people who will say that before you come um, for consultation, you need to pay a certain amount of money. And um, is that corrupt in itself? Um, I'll leave that to the best judgment of the viewers and those who have that gift to themselves. But if somebody comes to me to confess that they are corrupt, I think it is not for me or it is not in my place to make a public display of that. So I'm not gonna take a bell in my hand and go around ringing and screaming that that pastor said they are corrupt because they came to confess to me. But I will only counsel them and pray with them and lead them on a path of repentance because coming to me is a demonstration that they have already repented and they want to break with their past. So I only help them to um, go on, on the right path and, and, and support them through. And one of the most important things about ministry is to build supporting relationships, relationships that can support you. So you, you can have a sort of um, um, a horizontal accountability where people who are at your level hold you accountable, they hold your hand. So I've got friends in ministry who will always pull me up and tell me that, hey, I think that thing you said is not right. I think the way you, are, you addressed your congregation, you could have done it better. I think the way you are, you are even dressed is not all right. And so we have that relational accountability. And as a Baptist minister, and this is a very um, important thing for me as well. Every Baptist minister signs on to something called the CMD or the Continuing Ministerial Development. And it's a form of accountability where you've got a mentor, you've got um, a, a spiritual director where you can make some of these confessions to, so that they can hold your hand in a way that you will not just fall flat and crush your ministry. You've been listening to an interview with Pastor Claude. Uh, Harmony Japong. He's the pastor in charge of the International Praise Centre London. And this is the first of a segment of series called This Is My Story. And you've been listening to the story of Pastor Claude Japong, and your presenter has been Frank Harden. Bye for now. <laughs>